Alrighty, so we're about to finish up all the concepts um, regarding sampling distributions, but the last thing is sample size. So, first let's talk about manipulating the width of the confidence interval. So a confidence interval can be made wider or narrower by manipulating one of two variables. So, the sample size used and the width of, conf and the, width of the confidence interval have an inverse relationship. An inverse relationship. Um, so what that basically tells you is that as one goes up, the other one goes down, right? So that's why they're inverse. So sample size goes up. What happens to standard error? Remember, standard error is basically some mumbo jumbo, but it's always divided by n, right? So for example, standard error for the mean is standard deviation over square root n. And then standard error for proportions is square root of pq over n. So n is always on the bottom. So if n gets bigger and it's on the bottom, that means this, the whole term, that standard error, goes down. Now because of that, what happens to margin of error? Margin of error is a z times the standard error, right? And the reason why I'm not putting x bar or p hat is because I'm just kind of re referring to either or. Um, so as the standard error goes down, what happens to the margin of error? It also goes down. And then since the margin of error goes down, that basically tells you how wide on, on each side um, the confidence interval is going to be, right? It tells you how much you're going to span above and below the sample, the point estimate that you're using. So here, the width actually goes down as well because a smaller margin of, margin of error means that my confidence interval is getting narrower and narrower. Does that make sense? And it kind of it makes sense that as you increase the sample size, basically your margin of error gets smaller and smaller because you're more and more accurate. You're getting closer and closer to the actual parameter you're trying to estimate. So having a sample size of 30 is not as good as having a sample size of like 1,000. That's when you know for sure that you know, your interval is going to be really, really small, and that's a good thing. So now another variable that we can change is the confidence level. So the confidence level used in the width of the confidence interval itself have an inverse, I'm sorry, have a direct relationship. So direct means as one goes up, the other one goes up, right? So confidence level, if this one goes up, what happens to my z critical? Basically, if we draw our little guy here. If the confidence level goes up, what's basically happening is that I'm including more and more, a higher proportion of observations, right? So 90%, 95, 99, 99.9. Um, so it's just getting wider and wider, right? So my Z is getting bigger because basically my Z is getting more and more extreme. My critical Zs are moving further and further away from the mean. So my critical Z goes up. So what happens to the margin of error? Remember, margin of error is just z times the standard error, right? So if z goes up, margin of error goes up. And then again, if the margin of error goes up, that has a direct relationship because it basically tells you how wide on either side this interval is going to be. Boom. So as sample size goes up, confidence width, the width of the confidence interval goes down. And then as the confidence level goes up, the width of the confidence interval also goes up. Cool? So now let's go ahead and t talk about our last kind of practical topic is the sample size determination. So when creating a confidence interval, conditions decided before can tell you what sample size you're going to need for this. And what I mean by this is maybe, for example, I tell you, you want to know how far above and below you want to be with your interval and also the confidence level that you want to have. So those are two very important aspects of the confidence interval. And once you have that, you can actually figure out how many samples you need in order to make this confidence interval with that level of confidence. Does that make sense? So you set these things up before, find out how many samples you need, and then get those samples, and then do your confidence interval. So by rearranging the Z formula, no, I'm sorry, the margin of error formula, you can find the factors that, inf that affect the sample size, or N. If there are any mention of a standard deviation, so you're working with means. Otherwise, if the standard deviation is not part of the problem, you will certainly be working with proportions. And so this is one thing that I want to touch here because this is the first time I actually have both of them in the same problem. But for example, if you throw in a lot of confidence intervals, some means, some proportions, you can't really tell the difference. 
the quickest way is to know whether they mention a standard deviation. If they say a standard deviation, you're definitely working with means. No doubts about that. Because for means, you have to get a standard deviation. So for example, calculating the standard error, the standard error needs a standard deviation over square root n, right? But now, what about the standard error for proportions? Standard error for proportions doesn't matter what a standard deviation is. You can't even get, nothing's really, there's no standard deviation with proportions. All it basically is is a square root of p, q over n. So if there's no standard deviation mentioned, that means you're definitely working with proportions. If there's a standard deviation in the problem, you're working with means. Cool, so I wanted to kind of touch upon that before we finished off the set, um, in case you do run into situations where some proportion problems are mixed in with mean problems and you can't really tell which one you're de dealing with. So here's our formula for, this one here is for means, and this here is for proportions. Yay. And so we have our breakdown of everything. So ZC is a critical Z score. Sigma is just a standard deviation. So plain old standard deviation. Don't do the standard error for this one. Um, margin of error is just your margin of error as we're, we're used to seeing before. And then P is the population proportion. So population proportion is going to be given to you. If not, we'll see what happens with that. And then Q is just one minus that, right? So again, it's P and Q is like a success and failure type of thing. Um, so yeah, and then once the sample size is determined, you always round up. Now why is that? So basically, you have to round up because, let's say we had a minimum sample size of 100.01, right? That's the minimum sample size that we're going to need in order for us to create this confidence interval with this level of confidence. And when I say this, it's just some random numbers, right? So 90% confidence level and you want it to be a width of four units, whatever. Um, so if that's the minimum, right? So that's like kind of our cutoff. If we use 100, if we rounded it down to 100, 100 doesn't make that cutoff. Does that make sense? So we have to go to 101 and that makes a cutoff, right? And again, with samples, you can't have, for example, you're testing something on babies. You can't have 3.2 babies. So if your answer is a decimal, round it up to the next one because that decimal is the minimum. So rounding down actually doesn't make you hit that minimum. So you go up to the next whole number. Does that make sense? And it's always a whole number because, again, you can't have 3.2 babies. you got to have three or four. <laughs> um, so for whatever reason, you're super obsessed with true blood. <laughs> um, and you want, to average, you want to estimate the average length for a true blood episode within two minutes. Um, so, standard deviation is assumed to be 10 minutes, and you want to be 99% confident in your interval. How many random, ra random episodes must you sample in order to create this confidence interval? So are we dealing with means or proportions? Boom. Means, right? Automatically. So that means it's n equals, we have our z critical, standard deviation over the margin of error squared. So the z critical, how do we get that before? What do we do to the confidence level? We just divide it by two, right? So the z critical, so confidence level over two. So let's get uh, 0.99 over two. <clears throat> so that's 0 0.495. So 0.495. 495, 495, keep going. Okay, cool. So 495. So again, we're in between, and we've actually seen this one before. So we're between 4949 and 4951 because both are one away. One is one above, the other one is one below what we're looking for. So since they're exactly in the middle, what do we do? We get the average, right? So we're at 2.57 and 2.58. We're somewhere in between those two. So if you take the average, you end up getting 2.575. Cool? So let's go ahead and go back to our problem. We got our Z is 2.575. Standard deviation is always going to be given to you. And actually, the margin of error is also always going to be given to you. But it's kind of sneaky the way they do this. So. The margin of error is basically how far above and below you want to be from 
your little estimate, right? So your p hat or your x bar, and then there's this margin of error above and margin of error below. So here, really the only other number in there anyways is two minutes, so it's kind of like a hint, like, okay, that has to be the margin of error. But basically what they say is that they want our estimate to be within two minutes. So two minutes above and two minutes below. Does that make sense? So you want to be sure, 99% confident that the mean actually lies within this span, this total width of four, right? But a margin of error of two on each side. Does that make sense? So this here is our margin of error. Okay. Me. <laughs> so we get a Z of 2.575. Standard deviation is assumed to be 10. Margin of error is 2. And square all that. So once we do all that mess, we get 165.77. Now, is that our final answer? No, right? We have to round up. So in this case, we would naturally round up anyways, but it's always up. So round up and we get 166. So this is our answer. Let me highlight this so it's not confusing. Cool. So we get 166. That's the minimum number of episodes we need to sample in order for us to come up with this interval that has a margin of error of 2. Cool. So example 2, you're running for student body president and you want to estimate, I don't know why you would, you want to estimate the you want the estimate of the proportion of people who would vote for you to be no more than 0.02 away from the true parameter with 90% confidence. What did I just say, right? <laughs> How many students are needed in your sample? So here again they're asking you for a sample size. Is there a standard deviation in that um, in that problem? No standard deviation mentioned, right? So it means we're working with proportions. So let's do it. N equals the z critical over the margin of error squared times p and q, right? So how do we get the z critical again? Confidence level over two. So that's 0.90 over two or 0.45. This is also another tricky one. So 0.45. 4,500. So here we are. 4,500, however, is right in between the two, right? So what do we do again? Get the average. So 1.64 and 1.65, right? So that means right in between is 1.645. So again, we've seen these before, so it should kind of be a recap, not anything new. Um, so that's our Z critical is 1.645. Awesome. Margin of error, what's our margin of error in this case? They want us to be no more than 0.02 away from the true parameter. So that means you want to be no more than 0.02 above or below. Does that make sense? So 0.02 is actually our margin of error. And these are actually keywords, no more than and within. Those are very two very key words for you to tell when they're talking about the margin of error. Right and now P and Q. So sometimes you're going to be given an estimate for P and Q. They'll say a study found that blah 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 this percent of people will vote for you, right? But sometimes they don't. And in the situations that they don't, you basically want to get the highest sample size that you would ever possibly need, just so that in case the proportion is a little different, you still kind of made that cutoff really high, so that it satisfies all other combinations of proportions. And what I mean by this is that, for example. If P was 0.4, Q is 0.6, PQ is then 0.6 times 0.4, so we get 0.24, right? Let's say P is 0.8, Q is 0.2, PQ then becomes 0.16. Now what about P is 0.5, and then Q is 0.5, PQ then becomes... 0.25. And actually, you can try all other combinations of P's and Q's, but essentially, P and Q being 0.5 each gives me the highest, basically, multiplying factor. Does that make sense? So this little PQ is basically what we're multiplying right here at the end. Does that make sense? So if you don't really have an estimate for P or Q, just use the P and Q that's going to give you the highest sample size so that you get the highest minimum 
sample size requirement, but if it's any lower, you still made that cutoff. Does that make sense? So that's basically why we use P and Q is 0.5 if you're not given anything. So let me go ahead and highlight this. When you're not given an estimate for P. Right, so we're gonna use 0.5. So kinda ran out of space now. Um, actually, we can make it fit. So 1.645 over the margin of error of 0.02. Square all that times 0.5 times 0.5, right? So we get a sam minimum sample size of 1691 0.27. Is that our final answer? No, right? We got to round up. So our final answer is then I'm going to just write it down here. N equals 1692 Bam. that's about it so that's sample size determination um, basically all the information is going to be given to you you just need to know when they're asking for it so if they ask you how many samples do you need um, how many individuals need to take a particular survey or whatever the case may be they're going to be asking you for a sample size you basically just need to decide am I working with means or proportions remember means is with standard deviations proportions is with no standard deviation. Um, and then, if you're working with proportions and you're not given an estimate, just use 0.5 and you'll be good to go. So that's about it for sample size. Let's go ahead and do some practice problems and we're done with this set.